Do y'all like my librarian aesthetic I got going on? I got the glasses, I got the cardigan. I'm comfy. So have y'all ever been watching one of those based on a true story movies and been like, I wonder what the true story is based on this because that's kind of what brought about today's case. So I was watching, I don't remember, I was scrolling through YouTube and you know how on YouTube they'll have like the free with ad movies? Okay, so this movie came up and I saw this movie many years ago when it first came out. It was a Lifetime movie, but now it's free on YouTube and it's called Amish Grace and it stars Kimberly Williams, Paisley, and it's got, um, I think Faye Masterson is in it. But I remember seeing this movie, I think it came out... It came out in March of 2010, which was my junior year of high school. I know, I'm old, I'm showing my age, I'll be 28, I'll already be 28 by the time this video goes up, but right now I'm 27. My birthday is on September 13th. And it was kind of back before I got heavy into true crime, like, as a kid I had always watched things like The First 48, and I remember the first documentary that I ever sat down and watched when I was like, five or six was on the toy box killer. So if y'all are wondering why I am the way I am now, it's because I learned about the, the toy box killer when I was like five. I remembered it and I put it on and I was like, I wonder what the true story on this is. And I looked it up and it's, it's an interesting one y'all. And it's not interesting the same way that Jonestown interests me or that cult interests me and that I'm fascinated by how many people can follow this one person. Can there be a video where I don't mention Jonestown? Probably not. But this one is a case where I have a lot of questions and I have answers to these questions, but for some reason I still can't wrap my head around this case. And I especially can't wrap my head around how the victim's families reacted. Today's case is about the West Nickel Mine shooting, which like I said, the movie Amish Grace is based off of, which is a very good movie. I know it's a Lifetime movie, but it's actually a pretty good one. So if you have not seen it, it's free on YouTube. You can go watch it. I think it's also free on one of those like Tubi apps or whatever. I watch Tubi a lot. <laughs> it's one of those free like TV show movies that have like movies and TV shows. They'll have some that people have heard of, but not that many that people have heard of. And it's, it's where I first watched Birdemic, which is like my one of my favorite movies. Okay, I'm getting sidetracked. So this case will not have that many photos in it. In fact, it might not have any photos because of the case, because of the victims. Like I said, Amish Grace is based off of it and Amish people don't take their photos. So I am going to stop talking and I am going to jump right into the case. On October 2nd, 2006, Charles Roberts entered a one room Amish schoolhouse in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He took the girls hostage, let the boys leave and barricaded the door when the cops arrived. A negotiation was unable to be reached and Charles shot every single one of the girls in the schoolhouse before turning the gun on himself and killing himself. Some of the girls did survive, but every single survivor had either mental or physical handicaps that still scar them to this day. Now, what would lead a man to kill innocent children? And why did he choose these girls specifically? Let's talk about the events that led up to these murders. Charles Carl Roberts IV was a milk tank truck driver who serviced several <laughs> There's a lot of sh sounds in here. I'm sorry, I can't talk. Charles Carl Roberts IV was a milk tank truck driver who was 32 years old that serviced several Amish farms in the Nickel Mines area. Charles himself was a resident of the Bart Township and he had three children and a wife. Now let's talk about nickel mines for a minute. The nickel mines that gave the town its name were worked in a deposit of sulfide ore, principally millerite. The mines were originally open in the early 18th century for copper, but were given up as unproductive. In 1849, the Gap Mining Company attempted to work the mines for copper, again unsuccessfully, but they did discover the presence of nickel in late 1852 or early 1853. 
the ore had previously been misidentified as iron sulfide. Gap mining then worked the mines for nickel until 1860 when they were closed as unprofitable. It sold the mine to Joseph Wharton in late 1862. Between 1862 and 1893, 4.5 million pounds of nickel were extracted from the site, up to 25% of world production in some years. Wharton refined the nickel in Camden, New Jersey, and was the first industrial producer of malleable nickel. He was influential in persuading the United States Mint to issue the first five cent nickel coins in 1866, using nickel produced from his mines. An Episcopal church was built in 1857 to serve the mining community at the time. In 1883, the town consisted of the superintendent's mansion, 23 miners' homes, a store with dwelling, and five outbuildings. Now, the mine closed in 1893 because of competition from the new nickel mines in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, and today no traces of the mines remain, except for a few waste dumps. The entire area is now agricultural. Nickel Mines is a tiny town, only 0.38 square miles, with a population of only 35 people, and in 2016 there were only 16 households. So before the shooting, Charles had actually left four separate suicide notes, three for his children and one for his wife, and his co-workers said that they had seen a change in him over the few months before the shooting and that he was much more upbeat and that he had kind of returned to normal from when he was depressed which is how he had been acting up until this change. And even the neighbors noted this change, but no one really, I guess no one really thought anything of it because he had just gotten back to his normal self, but that's something to note in people that are planning to commit suicide is they'll usually act more upbeat because they know what they're going to do. So the morning of the shooting, his wife had seen him at 8.45 walking the kids to the bus stop before she left. And when she got back at 11 a.m., she found the suicide notes. Charles called his wife from the school on his cell phone and told her that he had molested two young female relatives between the ages of three and five, 20 years before when he was 12. And he said that he had been daydreaming about molesting again. But on October 4th of that same year, so just two days after the shooting, the relatives that he had named came forth and said that no any, no sexual abuse had occurred. So take that as you will. Something important to note is that nine years before the shooting, Charles actually had a daughter who only lived for about 20 minutes before she died. And that is very sad. I, I feel horrible for him and his wife. And that is one of the worst things that you will ever go through is having a miscarriage or having a stillborn or having a stillborn child or having a child that only lives for minutes before losing them. One of the notes that he wrote, I think it was the one to his wife, talked about how he was feeling depressed and despondent over his daughter. Charles backed his pickup truck to the front of the schoolhouse and then entered at 1025 AM after the kids came back from recess. He asked the teacher, Emma Mae Zook, and, er, Zook, Zook, Z-O-O-K, I think that's Zook. Emma Mae Zook, and he also asked the students if they had seen a clevis pen on the roads, which if you don't know what a clevis pen is, I didn't either. It's basically a pen that's used in place of a fastener for rivets and bolts, and I'll put a picture up on the screen so that way you can see exactly what I'm talking about and what he was asking about. And apparently when he asked this, he kind of mumbled it and no one could really hear what he said. So they were all just kind of like, no, we haven't seen it, which <laughs> reminds me of any time someone will ask me something and I can't hear them and I'll keep being like, what, what? And then finally just be like, yes, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm agreeing to, but yes. Or sometimes I'll say no, but. So Charles left to his truck and at that point they just kind of thought that he had come back to ask about this clevis pen because he also didn't make any direct contact when he asked this. So everyone thought that he had come back to ask about this pen and that was it, but it wasn't. He came back from his truck holding a Springfield Armory XD 9mm handgun, which was one of three weapons. The others being a Browning BPS 12 gauge pump action shotgun and a Ruger M77.30 06 bolt action rifle. I don't know anything about guns, 
So I hope I'm saying that right. And he orders the boys to help carry these items in his truck to the classroom. As well as these guns, Charles had 600 rounds of ammo, two knives strapped to his belt, synthetic black powder, which was used for reloading bullets, and two cans of smokeless powder. He also had a change of clothes, toilet paper, and earplugs in a five gallon bucket. His toolbox contained tools such as a hammer, a hacksaw. In another box, there were wire ties, eye bolts, rolls of clear tape, and other hardware, most of which were bought at a nearby store. I don't know what he thought 600 rounds of ammo was going to do in a one-room schoolhouse, but to me, it really sounds like he wasn't planning on leaving anyone alive. Now, there was a young girl there named Emma Fisher, and she and her mom were there because her mom was visiting. So they both escaped and ran to this nearby farm so that way they could get help. And Charles saw this, and he ordered the boys to stop them from running, and that he'd shoot them if they got away. Emma and her mom reached a farm and asked a man named Amos Smoker to call 911. Meanwhile, the rest of the boys were carrying shotguns, lumber, a stun gun, wires, nails, tools, a small bag, and a wooden board with multiple sets of eye hooks into the schoolhouse. And this bag that he brought in contained the change of clothes, the toilet paper, candles. There was also candles in there. <laughs> I don't know why, but there were, he had candles in there too. And it also had the flexible plastic ties. And he was using this wooden board to barricade the doors. After this, he told all of the girls to line up against the chalkboard, allowed a pregnant woman and three adults with infants to leave. This is also when he told all the boys that he could leave. Nine-year-old Emma also escaped, like I said earlier, but her older sister was unfortunately still in the schoolhouse. Charles tied up all of the girls before pulling down the window shades and barricading the doors. And the only reason that Emma actually escaped was because one of the window shades was faulty and he was having trouble getting it down. And she took that opportunity to run. So 911 gets this call from this Amos Smoker guy and they got it at around 1036 in the morning. And the first trooper arrived at 1042. So it was super quick. While this trooper was waiting for backup, he contacted Charles via the PA system. So you know how like in movies or if you've ever actually, hopefully you haven't dealt with, you know, a cop dealing with a hostage situation and they don't actually go in, they'll call on the PA and it'll broadcast it. That's what he was trying to reach Charles with. He asked Charles to throw out all of his weapons and leave the school, but Charles refused. By 11 a.m., a large crowd had formed, including cops, EMTs, and I believe everyone in the village, like all the people that weren't in the schoolhouse. So all the adults and the boys were all crowding around the schoolhouse. So the cops were continuing to try and talk to Charles and get him to throw out his weapons and leave and let everyone live. But Charles just kept refusing and he kept threatening to kill all the kids inside. Some of the girls talked amongst themselves during this ordeal and I, I can't imagine what they're feeling right now. You know, these are young girls. And they probably never expected to have to deal with this because the Amish are a peaceful people. I don't even think, I don't think the Amish even have guns. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think at least at this time, the Amish didn't have any, any guns. So there were these two sisters named Barbara and Marion. Marion actually told Charles to shoot her first. Barbara told him to shoot her after. And another girl named Anna Mae asked to be shot next. Marion and Barbara were actually Emma's sisters. And Marion thought maybe that by asking him to shoot her, that maybe all the others would be spared, but. Barbara was wounded and unfortunately Marion was killed. By 11.07 a.m. Charles began shooting the victims. State troopers approached and as the first state trooper approached the window, the shooting had stopped. And that is because Charles had ended his own life. During the shooting, Charles had fired at least 13 rounds and in total six people including Charles died. Five of them were injured. I'm gonna read you off the names of these victims because it's public information and I think that their names deserve to be heard. So the five girls that were killed were 
Naomi Rose Ebersol, age seven. Marion Stoltzfus Fisher, age 13. Anna Mae Stoltzfus, age 12. Lena Zook Miller, age eight. Mary Liz Miller, age eight. And I know, I know I've butchered these names and I'm, I'm sorry. The ones injured were Rosanna King, age six. Rachel Ann Stoltzfus, age eight. Barbara Barbie Fisher, age 11. Sarah Ann Stoltzfus, age 12. And, and Esther King, age 13. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that Charles had said that he had been thinking about molesting again, and they found KY jelly in his bag. So it's heavily believed that he had planned on assaulting the girls before he killed them. And I think, I truly believe that if Emma hadn't ran and hadn't gotten help and that he knew that it was only a matter of time before the cops showed up, I really believe that if he didn't, that if Emma hadn't ran and gotten help and he had the time that he needed, he would have. There were also notes found in Charles's belongings that talked about his anger at God for killing his daughter those years earlier. As the police entered the school, the wounded girls were taken to different hospitals. Two of the girls died at the school. One was dead on arrival at Lancaster General Hospital. Two sisters survived until the early hours of October 3rd when they were taken off of life support. The surviving victims were stabilized and transferred to a hospital with a pediatric trauma care unit. Three were sent to Penn State Children's Hospital. Four were taken to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. One was at Christina Hospital in Newark, Delaware. And one was initially sent to Breeding Hospital and Medical Center via helicopter but they were then transferred to Children's Hospital after they were stabilized. Most were shot in the back of the head via execution style and there was bullet holes, blood, and glass everywhere in this school. So I imagine what probably happened is that Charles made the girls lie down in front of the blackboard and he just went down the row, shot them in the back of the head. Oh my God. My personal feelings on this man, y'all know how I feel about people that hurt or that murder children. I think they are some of the worst people. This man is included in that. I'm, I'm gonna talk about. So normally the Amish do not accept any kind of charity, so they don't accept like donations or anything. But in this case, they actually accepted the donations because the Amish people are not allowed to have health insurance. So since they don't have health insurance, it's no secret that in America, healthcare is not cheap, especially not the care needed to keep these girls alive. So they used the donations that were given to them to pay for these hospital bills. Now let's talk about the survivors of this awful tragedy. Rosanna King, the six-year-old that was injured, as of 2016, still cannot talk, walk, feed herself, and has seizures. So she seems to have gotten it, I mean, they all got it bad, but she seems to have gotten it the worst because we're, I'm going to talk about it later, but they actually rebuilt the school in a different location. And when it was opened a year later, she was the only one of the survivors who was not well enough to attend this school. Now, there is a boy named Aaron Esch Jr. And he struggled with survivor's guilt really bad after this. He did an interview where he, it was some years later, I think it was 2016 that he did this interview where he talks about how for a long time, he was convinced that if he had stayed, he could have saved the girls. And for quite a long time, Aaron couldn't even eat because of his survivor's guilt because he, I can't even imagine going through something like this. And because he was unable to eat, he actually became anorexic. And he also ended up with panic attacks, which understandably so. In 2007, he ended up in a hospital ward close to death because he would not eat. He says that the reason that he would not eat is because he couldn't control what happened to the girls, but he could control what he was eating. 
At that point, when Aaron was in the hospital, he had three state troopers visit him and tell him, you know, there's nothing that you could have done. It's not your fault that this man murdered these girls. And Aaron said this is really what saved his life, was these three state troopers coming to tell him that it wasn't his fault that these girls died or got injured. Aaron now works in construction and he hopes to eventually get married and have a family of his own. Barbara Fisher ended up getting married and Marion's parents said that they don't see her as a hero and that it took them, that it wasn't easy to forgive. John, her father, said that he saw the wounded girls and he was angry and that if Charles had assaulted the girls that he would have wanted to see justice serve but that he would not want the death penalty for Charles. Sarah Ann has fully recovered and the whole community calls what happened as the happening and all of the survivors are still in the community of West Nickel Mines. So they all stayed there because that's that's their home. That's that's where they know. So in October of 2016, there was actually a picnic held for the families of the victims to mark the 10 year anniversary of when this happened. And first responders went as well as the whole community. The father of Anna Mae, one of the girls who was killed, he said that it took him a long time to forgive Charles, for to fully forgive Charles for what happened. 11 days after the shooting, a new school in a new location called the New Hope School was built after the old one was demolished. So I said earlier, I don't like people that hurt or that kill children. That is still true. But what you'll notice throughout this video is that I have not gone quite as hard in on Charles as I have everyone else that I've talked about that has harmed a child. And it's not because I think that this guy is less bad than the others like Angela McAnulty or Rachel Feisner, but that's because of how the victim's families have reacted to this. I still think this man is awful. I still think he's a piece of human garbage, but Let's talk about why I haven't gone quite as hard on him as I have others. So this case gained national attention. I mean, obviously it, it had a movie made about it, but the reason that this case gained so much attention is because of how the Amish community's reaction to the family of Charles and towards Charles himself after his death. Something very important to note about the Amish community is that forgiveness is deeply rooted in their beliefs. They heavily believe in letting go of grudges and that is exactly what they did here. The grandfather of one of the victims preached to the younger ones not to hold a grudge and not to hate Charles. And they even comforted Marie, which that's Charles's wife's name. I don't think I ever said it. They comforted Marie and their kids after the shooting and even offered their forgiveness to her. Marie said in an interview that she and her father saw a group of Amish people coming to her house and her father actually offered to go out and talk to them because they thought that the Amish were there to just chew them out and to tell them how much they hate them. And Marie had actually said that if that's what they had done, she wouldn't have blamed them because that was within their right to do so. However, as Marie was watching through her window, she saw this group of Amish men reach out and put their hand on her father's shoulder and even brought Marie food. They were concerned about her and her kids because they said that she, you know, she had just lost someone too. She lost a husband, their, their children lost their father. And the, the Amish community even went to help Marie when the media came to harass them at Charles's funeral. They put themselves directly in front of the news camera when the news was trying to get photos and videos of this funeral which if you know anything about the Amish community, that is a huge deal because they don't believe in taking pictures. They they don't believe in any of that. So it, it was a huge deal for them to, you know, do this for Marie. Marie was also one of the only outsiders allowed to attend the funerals of the victims. And Charles's mother, Terry, is a, now a friend to many of the families in West Nickel Mines. It came out later that the Amish school was not targeted specifically because they were Amish, but just because it was a convenient location because Charles only lived like, I think maybe a few miles, if that, from the schoolhouse. It's believed that by killing the girls, Charles was taking his anger out on God 
against the girls. The Amish community also shared some of the donations that they received with Marie to help her with whatever she needed. And I just, I really can't get over how the Amish community handled this. It's one of the biggest stories of forgiveness that I have ever heard. And if the Amish community forgives and is at peace, then even though I know I'd never be able to forgive this per this, in my opinion, awful human being, if he harmed my children, then I'm happy that they're at peace. Anyway, that is the story of the West Nickel Mine shooting and this I just, I can't get, I, I can't get over how the Amish people were so able to forgive him. And I know, I know they, it did take some of them quite a while to fully forgive him. But I just, the fact that they were able to forgive him at all is what gets me. What do y'all think? Would y'all be able to forgive someone that hurt your children? Would, I don't know, man, just. Let me know what y'all think of this one in the comments because this is such a unique case. You hear all the time about people who aren't able to forgive those that hurt their family members and especially parents that say they can't forgive the people who hurt their children. So I want to know what y'all think. Let me know down in the comments below and I'll see you all in my next one. Bye!